Today's video covers the theme of the course. The topic is called Perception and Imagination, or the topic of the course is called Perception and Imagination. But as I'll explain with this presentation, the early modern conversation about perception and imagination begins with a rejection of naive realism in favor of a, of a range of philosophical views about perception that we can broadly call representationalism. But first, a bit of background. In the early modern period, that is the 17th and 18th century, philosophers became very interested in questions about perception, i.e. about the connection between sensation and knowledge and ideas about the world. By early modern philosophers, I mean people like René Descartes, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, George Berkeley, David Hume, and Immanuel Kant. These are the philosophers that we're going to be looking at, but there are a lot of other philosophers as well who are engaging in this conversation about perception. People like Malbranche, Elizabeth of Bohemia, Spinoza, and Leibniz. We aren't going to read from these folks for this class. Why? It's partly for practical reasons. We have limited time and choices had to be made but it's partly for substance reasons as well. These philosophers, except for Elizabeth of Bohemia, uh, included theological debates in their theory of perception and imagination, and in this course we're not focusing on the larger debate about how great of a role God may or may not play in perception. But nonetheless, with all these philosophers, or with all these philosophers, uh, questions about God aside, what they were debating about was the role of thought in perception. Sensation is clearly physical, but perception seems to involve more than physicality. Perception seems to be ideas-based. What do I mean by that? Well, think about it. We use our bodies to know about the world. Our eyes see things, our fingers touch, and our ears hear, etc. But Aren't these nonetheless thoughts? Our bodies, our sensing organs, are sending the brain signals that the brain interprets as a visual image or as a physical sensation, a sensation of cold or of pain or of brightness. But if this is how we know about the world, aren't we effectively getting our information indirectly? We're getting them via a series of signals that our brain interprets. But doesn't that mean that we may be wrong? Or that our sense organs are giving us an image that we make sense of, but that could actually be very different from how things actually are? So why is this worrying? Our early modern philosophers um, thought of this question in terms of what they called mind dependence. This isn't a term that, uh, that we use too often in contemporary philosophy of mind, but it came up a lot for our philosophers. Ideas are in the mind, right? So you need a mind to think, to think them. But perception is about mind independence. What we want to know in perception is about things outside of mind, things that are still there, whether we think about them or not. But how can we possibly know such things or know about such things? In order for us to know them, we have to think them, right? But we can't know about things apart from how we think of them. So how would we know if something exists independently of thought. Now, even if we use logic to determine that it must be the case that objects exist outside of our thoughts, so just because there aren't humans to think about things, we can logically say that doesn't, that doesn't negate their existence. We can maybe find scientific evidence to say there were definitely dinosaurs, even though there were no humans to think about dinosaurs. But even if we use logic to determine that it must be that objects exist outside our thoughts, we still have a problem. We are, are still dependent on our senses to generate our experience of 
But what if our senses are wildly off? How would we know something like that? So this is the core problem that our philosophers are trying to solve. As we'll see next time, Descartes got this ball rolling. That's why we're going to look carefully at what he says about this. Every philosopher we're, lo we're looking at is picking up from what they do or do not think that Descartes got right on this question. But let's return to our theme. Broadly, there are two major ways that philosophers talk about perception. Effectively, you have direct realism um, and, uh, sorry, uh, effectively you have those who agree with direct realism and those who don't. All of our philosophers are going to fall into the latter camp. They think that direct realism is wrong. But first, what is it? The direct realism doesn't fall into all the distress that I just outlined abo uh, above or, or previously. On this view, on the direct realist view, our senses just reliably put us in contact with the world. So here you have a scheme of our five senses, and they are designed such that they get us in touch with, uh, with uh, information about the world. They tell us, our eyes tell us how things look, our, our skin tells us how things feel, our nose tells us how things smell, our tongue tells us how things taste. So this view is largely unproblematic. It has we see things, there's the object, we touch it. This is the direct or naive uh, view, uh, direct realism view. So then we say, yes, this apple is definitely red, shiny, and smooth. No problem. So that, that is this view. Um, in this view, our senses are just by and large reliable. Now, after the early modern period, this view um, sees a resurgence. And perhaps you'll see why by the end of this course. There's definitely an appeal in direct realism's simplicity. Um, and that view, and the direct realism view has a lot of advantages. It's straightforward. It avoids skepticism about the senses. It matches our common sense view. In the early modern period, though, direct realism was flatly rejected. Again, Descartes started this, and we'll look at that more closely. He has a, a, a careful argument against direct realism. So in the early modern period, following from Descartes, the idea was that direct realism was naive. It was a naive and unphilosophical view. Um, and so this isn't just this isn't just about prejudice, about what the what they call the vulgar or the common folk think. They, there was, uh, each philosopher has a very careful argument for why we should reject uh, direct realism. The idea was that it had to be wrong. So why? So we're going to get to that because each each philosopher has their own careful argument that we're going to we're going to look at and analyze. Um, but in general, it comes down to what I was saying earlier, that you can't separate a physical sensation from thought. So they argue that it has to be the case that thought mediates between objects and our experience of objects. Direct realism has some major problems or some unexplained issues. So there's lots of cases where our senses don't simply put us in touch with how things really are. Um, there are cases where we can't agree on what our senses are telling us. So here's a case in point. Remember this controversy? Is this dress white and gold or blue and brown? Or these shoes, are they turquoise or are they pink? So the idea is that it just seems wrong 
to say that our senses are straightforwardly telling us about how the world is. There are cases of optical illusion. There are cases where we of hallucination, where you think you see something that isn't there. Uh, or where, as you're going to see with arguments from coming from Locke and coming from the empiricists, there's lots of good reasons to say, look, the senses are telling us about how we are experiencing the object. That is in us and not in the things in themselves. That's the problem with direct realism. It assumes that how we experience the world must be how the world actually is. And that maybe puts too much faith in our individual senses. So what's the alternative, though? So here we get to our main theoretical framework, representationalism. Remember that word. It'll come up a lot. So representationalism. This is the course's central theme, really. It's Representation is a catch-all term for a variety of theories about perception. But we can say that the philosophers that we're studying more or less all fall into the representationalist camp in that they reject direct realism. They all think that Perception involves more than just simply being directly in contact with the world. They argue that it must be that the way that we experience the world is through mental ideas that are the objects of sensation. So here's how broadly speaking a representationalist, especially of the early modern variety, thinks about perception. So sense data, in this view, has to be converted into thoughts, ideas, in order for us to have an experience of the object. So if you look to the right-hand side of the screen, that is the, the idea is that it's on that side of the screen, that's where perception is happening. We have a direct impression through the senses of the table, but what is really getting us to this conclusion, this table is round and made of wood, is the idea of the table that matches what is outside the mind. But in order for us to really have a perceptible experience of the table and to think about the table, it's all of the mechanics that are happening inside the mind. It has to be converted somehow from the physical sensation of the table to a mental idea of the table. In other words, the mind is playing a mediating role. And that's why it's called representationalism. What we are engaging with when we think about the table is the mental representation of the table, and not the actual table in the world itself. Somehow it has to go through the mind in order for us to be able to come to this kind of conclusion. This table is round and made of wood. So this means that perception is more complicated than just physical sensation. Raw sense data is, in a, in a way, it's like zeros and ones, in the sense that it's just code that has to be converted and combined somehow in order to have any meaning for us as thinking beings thinking about the objects of perception. So this means that there must be some kind of faculty, um, that like a converting faculty in the mind, some mediator between raw sense data and ideas. What is that faculty? It's the other half of the theme of this course. That's why this course is called Perception and Imagination. So what what I'm very interested in, in my own research, and then what I'm focusing on in this course, is the way that our early modern philosophers understand that to at least some degree, imagination has to play a role in combining sensation or making sense of sensation, and that that is what we mean by perception on the early modern view. So on this view, on this view you can't really cleave perception and imagination cleanly apart. But as we'll see in this course, each of the philosophers we're looking at is really trying to think out carefully what 
what is the imagination? What do we mean when we say imagination? Is there just one kind of imagination? How do we get from a physical sensation to the idea? What is the imagination doing to make that possible? So these are the themes that we're going to be looking at, and you're going to see each philosopher has a slightly different view. So here's a table that kind of meant to indicate these two sides of what's happening in perception. On the one hand, you have sensation, which is uh, sort of direct sensory contact with the outside world and objects. And then on the other side, you have mental activity that is indirectly connected to the objects of sensation. So note that sensation does not equal perception. So when we talk about perception, we're talking about the collection of mental activities that put us in touch with objects with the world, or with objects and with the world. This means that perception includes sensation, but it doesn't stop there. It includes ideas, memories, belief, and imagination. So perception is a broader term than sensation. So sometimes our philosophers are going to call it sense perception in order to indicate they're just talking about sensation, but they'll use perception, just the word perception, to refer to this gamut, this collection of mental activities that's involved with us thinking about the objects in the world. So now for some historical context. The early modern period of philosophy essentially starts with Descartes. Whenever I teach Descartes, I try to pull the focus away from arguments about the existence of God. Uh, this Undoubtedly, this is an important part of, the, of his meditations and Descartes' works. But I find students often get the impression that Descartes' ideas and philosophy is based, uh, is, is, is just about making some kind of argument for God that is seen as really suspect, um, as old-fashioned, uh, and not very credible. And in, in that way, he uh, is often, his ideas are dismissed. And I really want to avoid having us do that in this course, because he's also in those meditations, laying a foundation for conversation about, about perception, about philosophy of mind, about epistemology, uh, that is not divorced from his arguments about God, but that begins a conversation that has nothing to do with arguments about the existence of God. And those are the ones that we are going to be focusing on. So Descartes is part of a scientific revolution. Um, and he is a scientist philosopher. In the age that uh, that he is writing in, it is no longer uh, sufficient to talk about, uh, to say that we get our knowledge about the world or we know about things through the hand of God. Not even Descartes thinks this. This is the radical shift that is happening in this period. So, Descartes was not a theologian. He was a mathematician, and he's an active participant in the same revolution that Galileo and, ne and Newton were part of. Descartes is a scientist philosopher, and the revolution that he brings to philosophy, he and his compatriots like Leibniz and, and Hobbes, is that he grounds philosophy in the axiomatic tradition of science. So here's an interesting fact. Galileo died at the beginning of the same year that Newton was born, and Descartes published the meditations effectively halfway between these major titans of the scientific revolution. Um, he publishes the meditations just one year before Galileo died, which means that he published it in the immediate aftermath of Galileo's condemnation by the church. Now, the scientific revolution runs through the early modern period. All our philosophers are part of 
This is a time when thinkers are no longer relying on the Bible for knowledge about the world, or at least not solely relying on it. There's new interest in scientific method, mathematics and physics and chemistry. Ideas are more and more being grounded in, in empirical research. Great advances are being made in mathematics and physics. Descartes and Leibniz, for example, are both credited with having invented calculus. At this time, philosophy and science are the same discipline. Um, and so the goal of philosophy is intertwined with that of science in this period. Just as before it was science, philosophy was intertwined with theology, at this point it begins to be a shift away from a theological role and more into a scientific role. So philosophers, the science philosophers of the early modern period, they're looking for what is the foundation of knowledge. As scientists, they want to be able to trust what science is telling us about the world. Also, science is telling us interesting or telling them interesting and disturbing things about what we've assumed we know about the world. Even at that stage, they were beginning to realize that the world seems to be composed of more than what the naked eye can see. Ideas about small, what we would today would call partic particles and molecules, starting to be a sense that this may be the actual foundation for objects in the world. So this is where questions about what, what we perceive of the world and what the world actually might be, so a sense that the, there might be a disconnect between those, that is part of the basis for what philosophers are looking, are looking for in our early modern period. If it's not, if our senses are not giving us an, uh, an exact image of the world, how much does it form the foundation of knowledge? And if it's not sensation, then what is it? So that's why our philosophers are so interested in perception. It's a pressing and urgent question. As the emphasis shifts from God as the source of knowledge, to the individual human, a shift that comes immediately out of Descartes' meditations, perception becomes a, more, uh, becomes a worrying concern. Scientific knowledge must presume that we are able to access information about the world. So it becomes a philosophical and scientific question whether our senses are to be trusted. It's an epistemological problem. What if we cannot know about the world because we cannot rely on our senses to give us that information. In other words, how good are our senses? What if we cannot know about the world because we cannot rely on our limited human senses to give us that information? So this is the graphic that I showed you earlier of what representationalism is telling us about the world, or rather about perception, that we have the uh, representation in our minds of what is outside the mind. But here's the concern. What if the graphic is actually more like this? What if this is the correct one? So this is what I was getting at earlier. It's one thing to be confused about whether a dress is blue or white, but it's quite another if everything our senses is telling us, our senses are telling us, is wrong. But as I said earlier, how would we know? Now, we can at least guess that our senses are telling us some things about the world that is right. Presumably, we must have some kind of legitimate access through our senses. It would be preposterous to think that our, sense, our sensible experience of the world was completely off. Right? But the scientific question, the one that Descartes gets everyone talking about, 
is whether it really is the senses that is the basis of our knowledge of the world. So obviously, sensation must play some role. But as a foundation of knowledge, how much of a role? So these are the questions broadly that our philosophers are grappling with. How, so how, how, just how mechanically, how does it work? So this is a process question. The empiricist philosophers like Locke and Berkeley and Hume and, and Kant to the extent that Kant is, Kant's a kind of empiricist. Um, this is part of the, this is, this is what they are especially concerned about, this process question. How do we get from a physical sensation to a mental thought? What's the process that's making that possible? Since physical sensation and mental thought seem to be two very different kinds of things. There's also a metaphysical question. And that is the question of what comes first. Do we have sensation and then thought? Or do we have thought and then sensation? So the empiricists like Locke and Hume are adamant that this can't be right. So it, for the empiricist, it has to be that we have sensible experience and then we have thought. But as we'll see, Descartes and Kant make a very credible argument in favor of the idea that it must be the opposite. We must have thought in order to make sense of sensation. We're going to look at that more, close, more closely later in the term. So to recap, these questions about perception are important, and sci important scientific questions, both in the early modern period and today. We, uh, what we and they are concerned about is one, how does the mind work in order to translate sense data into knowledge about the world? Two, how reliable are our senses? And three, and this is an important one, how can we tell the difference between what is real and what is imagined? So you might be thinking that surely we're no longer worried about this. Maybe our early modern philosophers, all, we're all just suffering from limited knowledge about how the brain works. We've solved this by now, right? We know how the brain interprets sense data from neurology. So does 21st century neuroscience fix this problem? Short answer is no. This isn't a problem that understanding the physical mechanics of the brain can really help us with. What we, what we want to know is, A, do we perceive objects directly and then think about them? Or do we have to think in order to perceive objects as being objects? And then B, how do we know the difference between the way something actually is and how we think something is? So these are the concerns that are guiding this course's investigation. Um, Descartes, we're going to see, raises the first problem, the problem that even contemporary philosophy still struggles to answer, still doesn't have a good answer to. The question is, if our senses are so reliably putting us in touch with an actual world, then how come we can't always tell the difference between imagination and sensation? So these are the concerns that are guiding this course's investigation. The philosophers I've chosen and the readings from these philosophers are all dealing with this precise problem. The problem starts with Descartes and then gets picked up by the philosophers who follow him. We'll, we'll be spending a lot of time with the empiricists, Locke, Berkeley, Hume, they thought that rejecting Descartes' innate ideas in favor of experience would ground them in this world and avoid the flights of metaphysics. 
so they thought they had a better answer. But we'll see that starting with sensation and experience has many drawbacks. Instead of connecting them to the world of objects, they actually end up even further away from it than Descartes was. Kant has an interesting solution, one that I think makes more intuitive sense if you, if you recognize that he's part and parcel of the debates that we're looking at here. If you've taken a course on just the critique of pure reason, Kant is um, making some arguments that can be hard to understand why he's, why he's making the, that kind of case, but if you place Kant in this conversation, it is, is more intuitive why he's tr what he's trying to achieve. He's offering us a way out of the problem of perception that was running through for more than 200 years in the early modern period. So at the end of the course, you'll be asked what you think about this solution. Did Kant solve the problem of perception? Or did he just give us a way to avoid talking about it? And finally, after we've read all the reasons why our philosophers reject naive realism and have seen what that commits them to in representationalism, you can ask yourself whether it might have made more sense just to support direct realism after all. At the end, you might wonder, maybe it wasn't so naive. That actually is the way that 20th century philosophers have responded to the debates that we're looking at, returned to the beginning point to say, what, what, what is wrong with just saying our senses put us directly in contact with the objects of the world? So at the end of the course, in the final test, one of the questions will ask you to consider what you think about that debate, the debate between naive realism and representationalism. So here are the parameters of this course's focus. And knowing this will help you decide what to focus on in your readings. So we're not interested in God in this course. Um, hopefully, most of you will have already read the primary texts that we're using in this course. You'll have hopefully read them in 210, philosophy, uh, Phil 210. If you haven't, that's okay. If you don't have that prerequisite, you should be able to follow and keep up quite well. You might want to spend a bit more time with the primary readings. If you've already read the meditations, you've already read Barclay, you then maybe can make a choice about I still recommend going back to them, at least skimming through them. You may find that you have a very different take on what Descartes is saying now from this different perspective. Um, so, um, but yes, on the question of God, as you're looking through the, the readings, you can skip over, uh, especially in Descartes, arguments about the existence of God. We're also not going to be talking about ethics, politics, mind-body dualism. So mind-body dualism is very important for contemporary philosophy, but for this course, just want to focus on questions about perception, about ideas, about imagination. And so if it's not pertinent to that in your readings, you can kind of gloss over it a bit. That is in the primary readings. Um, so yeah, so ignore the ontological argument in, uh, for the existence of God in Descartes. The reason why I didn't just not assign those uh, parts of the meditations is because the, he, it's the fourth meditation where he's really getting into the ontological argument, but he begins and ends that meditation with conversations about perception. So I found if I removed a meditation because I wanted to focus on perception, I, was, I would be skipping over important information, epistemological information. So that's why I'm giving you the permission to skip it, because the beginning of the meditation does talk about things that we need to know. Reading quizzes. So every week, 
I have a, I'll be assigning a reading quiz. And those reading quizzes are on the secondary sources. So you'll notice, and, um, and I went over this as well in the introductory video, that the readings are a combination between the primary reading and a more contemporary academic article about the primary reading. The quizzes are going to be about the academic articles, uh, asking you uh, questions that are intended to A, to guide your reading, and to um, uh, get you to focus on the main, the main points of the article. So they're not going to be tricky, um, detailed questions. The questions are designed such that as you're looking for the answer to that question, you'll be getting to the most useful part of the article. So reading quizzes on the secondary sources, but that doesn't mean that you can ignore the primary readings. The essays and the final tests call for an understanding of the primary readings. Probably even in 2.10, you didn't get uh, the depth into Hume uh, that we're going to get into. Uh, we're going to be reading the Treaties of Human Nature as opposed to the Inquiry. Um, so don't ignore the primary readings. You're going to need them for the essays and for the final test. More about that is in the introductory video. So that's the first lecture. The theme was of today's lecture was naive realism versus representationalism. I want you to keep that theme in mind as we read through because as I'm going to try to focus as we go through each philosopher, that is a major debate, that a, a, a line of conversation that we can draw between all the philosophers that we're including in this course. So I hope that you enjoyed this video. Tune in again for video number three where we're going to be talking about just Descartes as well as the secondary reading on Descartes from Harry Frankfurt. Thanks, everybody.